Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Oh, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And to the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We do thank you for your word, and certainly it is powerful and transformative. It is our very life. So may there be life this morning, new life, renewed life, abundant life coming out of your word. Oh, let us not take these things lightly. I pray in Christ's name, amen. It's been a little while since I've done a review of where we are, so let's do that. Chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus sort of coming on to the scene of his public ministry, announces that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Shortly afterwards, he then goes up some height, and he sits down to teach, his disciples gathering all around him. And so that's something critical to remember about the Sermon on the Mount, is that it's being delivered to his disciples. Yes, there's a great crowd, so others are hearing it, others can benefit from the Sermon on the Mount, but the whole discourse is light and life to those who believe. So we should be hearing this as light and life unto us. And as he goes into the Sermon on the Mount, he begins with the Beatitudes, the blessings for all those who love and follow Jesus. And then there's the blessed effect of being a follower of Jesus, that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Such realities are the law of the kingdom of God, the kingdom in which we live. Then in chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus begins to show how the, the law of the kingdom of heaven is greater than the law of Moses, the old Mosaic law. And the law of the kingdom of heaven has a righteousness that's given, not a righteousness that can be earned. And Jesus demonstrates this through talking about anger and lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love. Particularly, particularly loving your enemies. Chapter 6, that begins with Jesus instructing his disciples how they ought to live in this very present kingdom of heaven, and he teaches them about these three very important spiritual disciplines. First, you have charity in verses 6 through 4. Then you have prayer in verses 5 through 15, and then you have fasting in verses 6. 16 to 18, charity, prayer, and fasting. Any true practice of these disciplines must not be about outward appearances. If you're doing it for the show, then it doesn't matter. Rather, it's about what's going on in your heart. These are expressions of the heart, a heart that loves God. They're things that you do with your body, the charity, the prayer, and the fasting. You do these with your body to draw your, your, your heart to treasure God more rightly. And that's where Jesus goes next in the Sermon on the Mount. What it is that you treasure in your heart. 
right? In chapter six, verse 21, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And after this, Jesus chooses four dispositions that help us disciples discern what is going on in our hearts. The first we saw last week, the anxious heart. This week, we look at two different dispositions, the critical heart and then the generous heart. And next week, we'll look at the obedient heart. Four dispositions, two are negative, two are positive. Anxious heart, critical heart, obviously, are negative. And the generous heart and the obedient heart are positive. So as we look at the critical heart and the generous heart today, the point of this message is the point of the of the title of the sermon, be generous, not critical. Now, when I come up here to preach, every time I am preaching above myself. Like I fall so far short every, of almost everything I speak about. I'm just as broken and sinful as anyone else here, and yet there are times when I'm confronted with the text where in some special way my wretchedness is exposed, and that happens in this text today, because I can be so critical. So I'm preaching to myself today as much as anyone else. Every week I preach to myself, but it feels even more significant Today, how I need these words, like in verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. To understand the teaching, what Jesus is really talking about, we need to know what kind of judgment he is referring to. He's not talking about judgment in an ultimate sense, like judgment over life and death or, or heaven, over, heaven and hell. Like we are saying that person is going to hell, and that person is going to heaven. That's not the kind of judgment Jesus is talking about. And and those things aren't ours to say anyway. The context of verses 1 through 5 makes it very clear what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about being critical. He's addressing a fault-finding mentality and a disposition of disapproval. A critical heart. A critical heart which has little, little forgiveness for weakness or imperfections. And don't we see this show up everywhere? You can be critical towards somebody's driving, critical towards somebody's parenting, critical towards someone's appearance, or critical towards someone's behavior, or their work ethic, or their intelligence, or their musical choices, or the way that your neighbor keeps their yard, or on and on. We can be critical of just about anything. It's almost infinite. And we are. Jesus says, don't be judgmental like this, lest you be judged. Verse 2, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you judge others, you will be judged, and the degree to which you judge others, that same measure of judgment is coming to you, is returning to you. So in other words, if you, if you frequently critique the little faults in people, the things that annoy you, the things that you see that you just don't get, you know what happens? Your faults and annoyances are magnified to those around you. They become glaring. Echoing Jesus' words, Paul writes, You have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So when I'm critical of somebody's attitude, and then I go and be grumpy, I'm a hypocrite, a complete hypocrite. So Jesus calls it in verse 5. People do not tolerate hypocrites. 
I mean, a, a hypocrite is one of the most repugnant things, right? How many people have been turned away from the church and, and perhaps even rejected Christ because of the, the hypocrites in the church? And I bet you the majority of those hypocrites are hypocritical because of their critical hearts, because they're being critical. They're judging other people when they themselves practice the very same thing. So people don't tolerate critical hypocrites. And neither does God tolerate it. Elsewhere in in Matthew, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So let's say a person never learns about the law of God, (laughs) and never have access to the Bible, perhaps. That person will be judged by the words that they speak, every critical word. So if you set a standard for people to live by, and they're not meeting that standard, and you're critical of them, and you point it out, and you find the faults, God's going to hold you to that same standard that you set. And isn't that right? And we see this all the time, you know, You look down at your nose at Mary Sue, that's an arbitrary name, because she's a gossip. And then you go ahead and gossip yourself. You're condemned. You've condemned yourself. That's a principle outside of the church, too, you know? This, this works everywhere in the world, so somebody is so critical of you for not being tolerant and they judge you and they won't even sit down to have a conversation with somebody of the opposing view in intolerance they condemn themselves it's a hypocrite now a very brief parenthesis if you ever wondered how God can judge or condemn unreached peoples of the world This is the answer. They condemn themselves. Close that parentheses. Because, well, I'll get to that. Then Jesus goes ahead and he dives right into a hyperbolic or exaggerated illustration, very potent illustration that drives this home. Verse 3, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Again, more rhetorical questions from Jesus as we have been seeing. In verse 3, he's effectively saying, why do you do this? Why are you so critical? Just as we saw with anxiety, Jesus is assuming that every single one of his disciples has a critical heart, struggles with a critical heart. In fact, the assumption is broader. Every human being on on planet Earth struggles in some way with a critical heart. And that's because we are all rife with self-righteousness, and we're all proud, and pride conflicts with pride, so as our pride rises, we see pride in somebody else, and, and they are at conflict with one another. Pride in them makes pride in me come awake. And we get critical. Realizing, or we need to realize that as that happens, we've got something in our eye. And it isn't little. You can't help but think that this illustration of Christ's was influenced by some time in a carpenter's workshop. Being a carpenter myself, working in that industry for a lot of years, you get stuff in your eye. Have you ever have you ever gotten sawdust in your eye? Like it hurts. It is very unpleasant. It's it's obvious to everybody around you that you have something in your eye because you're blinking all funny, and usually your eyes are watering, and you know you're you're kind of doing one of these things, 
And it's obvious. You've got something in your eye. You know, back in my 20s, I worked on this framing crew, a bunch of young guys throwing up houses and, and a lot of machoism, right? Well, there's this one guy on the job site who got something in his eye, some sawdust. None of us could see it, but it was so irritating him that he th literally took off his tool belt, threw it on the ground, and he said, I'm going home, and he left. He went home. And that wasn't the only time he did it. He did it two or three times. And so there we are watching all of this happen. This guy goes home because there's a speck in his eye. And we're like, where's his fortitude? What kind of man would leave work because he has something in his eye? I mean, you can just imagine how the conversation would go on a construction site. It wasn't friendly. It's hard not to be critical of him. Who goes home when you have a speck in your eye? But the truth is, even if he wasn't making excuses, I've made up excuses to go home early. There were times where I made up a lie and I just didn't go into work that day because I wasn't feeling it, or I wanted to do something else. Condemned. I'm a critical Hypocrite. Even if he was impaired with the sawdust in his eye, and that was t entirely legitimate, I've been walking around with his giant log sticking out of my own head. Now, of course, Jesus in this illustration is speaking hyperbolically. It's exaggerated. It's almost ridiculous. I think, I think he is trying to be somewhat ridiculous. I think there's a humorous element into this illustration that he gives, talking about walking around with a, a plank in your eye. I mean, the word plank that he uses is, is like a, a floor joist, like a, a giant beam used for building in your house. So yeah, it's an, an enormous piece of wood sticking out of your face. There's two things to notice about what it means to have a log in your eye in this illustration. First, if a speck is obvious to someone else, isn't a log even more obvious? Like ridiculously obvious? Second, if there's a log in your eye, are you, even able, are you even able to see at all? Wouldn't it block both of your eyes? Whichever way it's sticking, can you see? That's what it's like with faults. Faults appear more obvious than your own faults, faults in someone else. And if that happens, if faults in somebody else are more obvious than your own faults, then that means that like having a log in your eye, you are blind. Your vision is blocked. And this is called a lack of self-awareness. Do you want to know if you have a lack of self-awareness? If you listen to this message and you think it's for someone else, if you listen to this and you cannot tell that there's something in your eye, it's because you lack self-awareness. If you've come to church this morning and you just saw so many things that are wrong and it happens every morning, maybe the way I talk or the things that I say, I've, I guess I shouldn't be too specific. <laughs> just pulled the e-brake on that one. Mm -hmm. Just like we saw in Proverbs, a fool doesn't know he is a fool. A person who lacks self-awareness does not comprehend that they lack self-awareness. Everyone else has the problems. Everyone else needs the fixing. Everyone else has faults that need correcting. Meanwhile, the rest of us are all bobbing and weaving in the hallway because you have a tree out of your head. Do you see people scatter when you come around? Back to the first implication of having a log 
in your face, in your eye. If someone else's faults are obvious to you, your faults are even more obvious to others, especially to God. And I think that's the main point here. It's not that if you pass judgment on another, then you're a worse sinner than the one that you criticize. No, the point is that such a fault that you're seeing in someone else is a tiny speck compared to the monstrous accumulation of sin that God sees in you. It's enormous. It's logs on logs on logs. The accumulated weight of your sin is immeasurably vast, so vast that sinners are condemned to an eternal hell to pay for it. And so how amazing it is then that that eternity of hell was swallowed up in Christ's death and resurrection. And so that now for all those who repent and believe, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are forgiven and you are free and forever, forever and all time, God chooses not to look at your faults, but to look past them. To not see what condemns you, but to declare you righteous. Praise God for his great generosity. And he will never turn a judgmental eye towards you. Never a shred of criticism, only love, only favor. Your heavenly Father chooses to look on you with generosity. Now, that doesn't mean that God is ignorant of your sins or faults. He is aware of them. He does see them. And so the implication is that both logs and specks need to be removed from eyes. They don't belong there, big or small. And so it is the living water of the gospel that removes logs and specks from eyes. And here's where we are responsible. Here's what we can do. Wash ourselves in the gospel Pour the cleansing water of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pour that water over yourself again and again. Let it get all those hard and hidden places of your heart, hard to reach and hidden places of your heart, because there is a lot of dirt that needs cleaning out. And when you realize that, there's a lot of work still here, maybe then, maybe then, you can help somebody else out with their speck. Because that's how we can recognize faults in people without being critical of them when we hold those truths in balance with the gospel. Right? Being aware of faults is a very different thing than being critical of faults. That's where Jesus takes us next. Look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Holy items before dogs, pearls before swine. Both of these have to do with treasures, treating treasures as if they are cheap, as if they're like, they're junk, they're trash. Now, I grant that this is a a little bit complicated, and it takes some unpacking for us to understand what Jesus is saying specifically in verse 6, and then how that relates to the rest of, to the context that it's in. So, so far in the Sermon on the Mount, what is it that Christ has indicated is a valuable treasure? He's talking about heavenly rewards quite a lot. And 620 talks about treasures in heaven. And what is the greatest uh, treasure in heaven? It's God himself. The most valuable being in existence. And the greatest thing that you and I possess, that we, in a sense, have at our disposal, that gives us access to God, is the gospel. 
Yes, the gospel may be the greatest treasure that you and I possess, have been given. And Jesus is teaching us not to continually offer the gospel to people who do not want it. Do not give the gospel to people again and again who to them it doesn't matter. Like, like the, the gospel of the glory of God's grace is cheap. And the things I have over here are better than the gospel of the glory of the grace of God. Such obstinate people are like pigs trampling underfoot precious pearls down into the muck. In Luke 10, Jesus says that if a person does not receive you and your message, then you are to leave them and shake the dust off of your sandals at them. And so at a certain point, if, if we continue to offer the gospel to, to people who don't want it, then we are the fools. Don't be surprised if those, turn, if those people turn against you and attack. Now here's how this relates to judging and I do think this is incredibly important. Verse 6 functions as a counterbalance. So if you're, Jesus here is telling us to make judgments in verse 6, right? If you're trying to discern if a, peop, if a person is going to trample the gospel under their feet, if they are obstinate, then that means that you are making a moral judgment about them, doesn't it? Moral judgments are good to know if something is wrong or right, that's a good thing. You have to make judgments. If you see someone's sin, you're making a judgment. And that's okay that you are able to judge on that level. And in fact, he's showing us that making moral judgments is, is a protection. It protects us from offering precious things to obstinate people. It protects us from getting ourselves into dangerous situations. And so we are to judge. But here's the difference between the two. We are to think critically, but we are not to be critical of heart. Think critically, don't be critical of heart. Don't judge, like we see in chapter 7, verse 1, does not mean don't think. Of course, thinking critically, that means being discerning of the world around you. We ought to know the things that are right and wrong and good and bad. A possessor of the word of God should, must strive to think critically on these issues because our world is a very confusing place. It's like Jesus says in chapter 10 of Matthew, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. To be a wise serpent in this context is to see the world as the world is. Jesus does not call us to a blind faith, nor does he call us to live with a blindfold on. So think critically. Even though we live in the midst of a world that would rather us not think critically. Because whatever a person believes about their gender, we're just all supposed to agree with. And if politicians tell us that something is good, then we're all just expected to go along with it. And if the movies show it to be acceptable, then we are supposed to accept it. And this world is working with a twisted morality, and it's trying to get our morality all twisted up too. But God has given us his word and embedded it within our hearts, and we shall not conform the king has commanded us to proclaim the gospel and, and to work this twisted up world into freedom. Our work is in part to untwist this world and so we shall judge, by, uh, judge not by appearances but judge with right judgment. So think critically in the world that surrounds you. Be wise as serpents Cast not your pearls before pigs. Think critically, but don't have a critical heart. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, and the one who receives finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Ask, seek, knock. All actions, all having to do with prayer. We learned much about asking when we studied the Lord's Prayer back in chapter 6. Knocking is about persistence on some level. Knock until that door opens. Don't give up. Keep knocking. Seeking, in my mind, is perhaps the most interesting of the three. It harkens back to last week's passage where we saw in verse, chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So seeking, as we think about what seeking is, seeking is different than asking. They're not synonyms as if God was saying, ask, ask, knock, or Christ was saying that. Seeking means something different than asking, and I believe that the connotation may be that sometimes we don't know exactly what it is that we should be praying for. We have some vague concept, but we don't know right where the bullseye is and what we're praying for. We just come to God seeking him earnestly because he knows what is best. We're seeking him and his will and his way. So either way, whether we're asking, seeking, or knocking, or all three, Jesus promises that if we come to him with our needs, he will generously give. He will generously give. This is another balm for our anxious hearts. This is certainly a balm for our critical hearts because in no uncertain terms, Jesus wants us to know that prayer is powerfully effective. Prayer is the most powerful tool that you have, human being. James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power at its working. Great power. And we hardly ever do it like we should. Prayer is effective because because God is generous. That's why prayer is effective. Prayer is effective because God generously gives good things. And once more, to emphasize this point, Jesus goes again to parable or to illustration. Uh, In verse 9, we see it. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Quick parentheses again. Many places the Bible teaches us that we are all sinful, or like we read here, Evil, we are evil. Jesus calls his disciples evil. Right there. Now, of course, he's referring to the state that we are born into and the many decisions that we, that we make with our lives, the sinful decisions. But, of course, this is in light of the fact that anyone who repents and believes in Christ has been entirely forgiven. Yes, there's evil, By grace, you are forgiven in Christ Jesus. Nonetheless, we all know it. Sin and evil still hardwired within us. And isn't that why he has to tell us not to be critical of others? Because we are. Close parentheses. So even we, even we who are born of this sinful race, Even we know how to give good gifts. So how much more God, right, who is the supremely perfect, the infinitely wealthy, the fountain of all goodness, the overwhelmingly generous God of all creation, yes, he knows how to give good gifts, amazing gifts, stunning, life-transformative gifts, equally as stunning, is that Jesus places no condition on God's generosity. Do you see that? Not one condition on God's generosity. Ask, seek, knock in faith and the Father will give you, the Father will be generous to you 
despite the fact that you are evil. That is the definition of generosity, I believe. The Father gives to those who ask him, even if those asking are evil. I would qualify it. There are other places in Scripture that qualify it. Evil though forgiven, evil though repentant. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that ask whatever you want and the Father's just going to give it to you. He is no sky vending machine. He is not your genie just waiting to grant your every wish. But God, knowing what is best, will give you what is best. And perhaps it's on the other side of pain. Perhaps it's not giving you what you want, but what is better. And perhaps it's making you wait. And you don't know, but he does know because he sees all ends and all possibilities and all goodness, and he promises to give you what is best. All we must do is ask. James 4.2, you do not have because you do not ask. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. <coughs> That's the golden rule. Jesus derives the golden rule from what he'll later call the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So do you hear the similarity between the two? Whatever you wish, Others do to you, do also to them. And of course, the essence of that golden rule is love. We all want love. We all want people to treat us with love. And so if you want to be loved, so should you love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love like this. And all scripture is fulfilled. Look back at Matthew five seventeen. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. How has Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets? Love. Most preeminently, love. Generous love. All that he did was in love. It, took, it was love that took him to the cross, and it was in love that the Father raised his Son. And it is, it is love that God generously gives to all who believe. Love, 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 God is love. So to be a disciple of him, of Jesus Christ, the exact imprint of the nature of God, Jesus Christ, the embodiment of love, pure love. If you want to follow him, then you ought to love. There is no room in a disciple's heart for selfishness. There shouldn't be. There's no room for selfishness in love. There's no room for a critical heart in love. Owe no one anything, writes Paul, except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. What do we owe one another? Love. We often feel like people owe us for all kinds of things. But it's a generous heart that swallows up that critical heart. You know, you can't say to yourself, all right, I get it, I am critical, I am judgmental, so I'm gonna stop that now. And then that's that. I mean, it would be kinda nice if it were that easy, but it isn't. You cannot say, I'm just not gonna be critical anymore. You need something else to, to come in and remove that log from your eye. You need some power to push it out. Do you know what it is? Love. Love is generous, right? 
This is what we see in our God, who he had every right to be critical of us. Countless things for him to look judgingly at us, and instead he chooses to be generous with us. Not to immediately snuff out our lives, though we deserved it, though we rebelled against him, but instead he sustains us and he feeds us and he clothes us, holding us together with the very word of his power and, and then with a generosity that overwhelms the soul he sent his beloved son, his one and only son, to die in our place, sinners like us, die, die for sinners like us, taking our punishment that we could be forgiven. This is generosity unmeasured. This is unbelievable generosity. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with Jesus graciously give us all things? Generosity without limits. And if we are in Christ, then we have been given his heart. That same type of generosity is supposed to dwell here. We are to live generously. We are to fight a critical spirit with generous love and do unto others as, as we would have them do unto us. So instead of finding fault in people, maybe find things to praise. Instead of seeing things to judge, seek ways to offer grace. How can you... How can you give grace to somebody? How can you help them experience grace so that they might see grace from their father more poignantly? Instead of being a, instead of being a source of discouragement, be a beaming source of encouragement. Don't you love people who are encouraging? You just love to be around them. They're, they're like an oasis, people who are encouraging. Yes, as Christ has done for you, so do for others. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Father, how we need your help to take these sinful, fleshly, critical hearts away. Replace those stony things with a heart of, a tender heart, a soft heart, a loving and generous heart that beats for you, loves the people around us. It's not something we can do on our own strength, so we come to you and we ask, we seek, we will knock until you give. We know you give good gifts. So help us, Father. Help us, Father, to be generous of heart, loving as you are loving, to do unto others as we would love to them to do to us. Pray these things in Christ's name.